Hello and good morning everybody. So in this section I want to informally introduce at least the beginnings of a new concept, namely of the efficiency of an estimator. And once we have this in place, I want to discuss a bit more about robust estimators with a view on efficiency and it turns out there is some trade-off to be made, namely more robust estimators have lower efficiency and in contrast estimators with higher efficiency are less robust. And on this scale I want to introduce two more estimators which are good in terms of breakdown point, so they are very robust but which then in exchange will have low efficiency. So let's see what we can do there. So I want to start by giving a very informal discussion of efficiency. The reason is one would need to know a bit more theoretical statistics to do that properly. So in theoretical statistics, efficiency is defined as something where I just want to write best possible variance of an unbiased estimator for a given estimation problem divided by the actual variance. So that is always less than or equal to 1, because best possible means smallest. We want estimators to have small variance, so the actual variance can either be the same, or if it's a worse estimator, it's larger. And the problem I'm trying to work around here is best possible variance is expressed in terms of Fisher information, and we just don't have that concept. So what I want to do here, just for the purpose of this section, is I want to just ignore that, and I want to here just use 1 over the variance of the estimator. And then, of course, we lost the constant on top, so our efficiency is no longer comparable to anybody else's efficiency. But what we can still do is we can still compare two different estimators. So if we have the efficiency of an estimator 1 and the efficiency of an estimator 2, and we want to compare them by taking the ratio, then we would get best possible divided by variance of theta hat 1 divided by best possible divided by variance theta hat 2. And you see these two terms, they don't depend on the estimator, that is what the best estimator does. So these two cancel, and then we have variance theta hat 2 divided by variance theta hat 1. And if we take the ratio of our term, well, the bit we omitted cancels, we will get at least the same relative efficiency. So that's what I'm doing in the notes, but even assuming that these variances we can often not work out. And if you read the notes, you see I'm cheating a bit because I'm never quite saying what we take the variance of. So this section, there are some formulas, but that is not meant to be a very theoretical section. So we could take either the variance of the beta hat j of one of them, or maybe of the vector of the beta hat j, then we would need to take the norm or something, or we could take the variance of the fitted values. But it turns out in practice that distinction does not matter so much. So let's not worry too much about that. Then in the notes I show you an example. So I don't want to go through all of these steps, but if we just assume x1 up to xn are normal distributed, mean mu variance sigma squared, and they are independent. I write iid for independent and identically distributed. Then we can estimate the mean in two different ways. And mu hat 1, I want to take just the standard estimator sample average, so 1 over n sum i from 1 to n xi. And in this case, we know variance mu hat 1 is sigma squared over n. You probably have seen this, or if you haven't, that is very easy to check. And if we take a robust estimator for the mean for mu hat 2, the obvious choice would be the sample median of the numbers x1 up to xn. And the sample median, you know the definition, that is you sort the samples in increasing order, so that's normally indicated using these round brackets. So that's the same numbers but arranged in a different order so that the smallest is on the left and the largest is on the right. And then if the number is odd, there is a middle element and that's the median. And if the total number n is even, then the middle is a gap. And we would then take the average of the element to the left and to the right of the gap. And now for comparison, we would need to work out the variance of the median. And that's not so easy because the sorting step is a bit awkward if you want to work out the variance. And I show you in the notes how to work around the sorting problem. 
So, it's possible to work out the density, so I'm not going to show that here, but in the notes I give a proper derivation of the fact that the density of the median, since the x1 up to xn are random, that is a random variable somewhere in the list here, that that is the original density times n factorial divided by n over 2 factorial. And I said n over 2 factorial, there are two different cases. So here I assumed that n is odd, so n is 2m plus 1, and that is the m down here. And then we have the CDF, the cumulative distribution function of the x to the power of m, and 1 minus the cumulative distribution function also to the power of m. And that's not a particularly nice expression, but that's the number, that's the density we know, so here that would be the normal density, and capital F is the CDF, so that there is no explicit formula, but that would be the otherwise well-known CDF of the normal distribution. So that is an explicit expression. And then in the notes I leave out the steps, but I tell you the result. So one can show that variance mu hat 2 is approximately equal to pi over 2 times sigma squared over n, and there is some approximation in the formula you get, so that is not true for every n, but for large n the ratio of these numbers converges to 1. So that is for large n. Let me maybe just this a bit less formal. So that for large n, and if we do what I just said, then we have the efficiency of sample mean divided by the efficiency of the median is, well, the variances, I just explained, swap over. So we have variance of x bar, and on top we have variance of x median. And then what we get is we get pi over 2, sigma squared over n divided by sigma squared over n. So we get pi over 2, and that is approximately 1.57. So that means the sample mean is about 1.57 times as efficient as the median. Or if we turn it around, the median is 1 over 1.57, so that is 0.64 times as efficient as the mean. Good, so either way we find the mean is a more efficient estimator than the median. And I hinted at this in the introduction that has to do with the robustness, namely more robust estimators, I'm trying to say, have a tendency of being less efficient. And here the median is robust, the mean is not, and we see, to go with this, the median has lower efficiency than the mean. Good, and mostly by analogy I want to make the point that a similar relationship holds for, the, for linear regression estimates. So let's not to be too pedantic here about what the details actually mean, but one can show. Usually the variance of unspecific here decays proportional to 1 over n for ordinary least squares. And I want to denote it by OLS here. And I say usually because there are special cases, even for a simple regression, if for example all the x values happen to be on the same spot, so if we get lots of samples here where there's error in the y, but the x's are all the same. In this case, we would just get never any information about the slope whatsoever. So taking more samples will tell us more about the intercept, but it will not tell us more about the slope. Though in this case, the estimator for the slope will not convert at all. Well, we divide by zero somewhere, so we cannot estimate the slope. And in this case, the variance of the slope estimator will not decay like 1 over n. And you can artificially construct examples, I think if for example xi is a plus 1 over i squared, then the xi are not all equal to each other, but they do rather quickly concentrate around the point a, so you get a bit of information about the slope of the regression line, but every sample, because the points get closer to a, contributes a bit less than the ones before, and I believe in this case you also do not get 1 over n. But in reasonable cases where the x values are actually spread, then it's very easy to get 1 over n. So 1 over n is the normal rate. Good. So that is the baseline. We are going to compare estimators to ordinary least squares. Then we did, for example, Huber's t function. That was one of the choices of what we can do for an m estimator. 
And Uber's T function, you will probably remember rho of epsilon was the same as for ordinary least squares close to zero, so one half epsilon squared if epsilon is close to zero. And straight lines, the formula was T times mod epsilon minus some constant if epsilon is further away from zero. And here robustness depends on T in the limit when t goes to infinity, we have always this, which would mean we have ordinary least squares. So then the relative efficiency would converge to 1, but robustness would go to 0 because we have more and more outliers which affect the estimate. And if t goes to 0, then we are here more and more where we have a straight line rather than a parabola. So we get more robust, but the efficiency goes down. And Huber, the man who invented that himself, suggested to choose T so that efficiency is 95% of that one. And I have not checked the mass, but apparently if you take T equals 1.345 times the standard deviation of the samples, then we have efficiency of Huber divided by efficiency of ordinary least squares is 0.95. And I said this, if T goes larger, the number goes closer to 1, but the method gets less robust, and if t goes smaller, then efficiency goes down, but the method gets more robust. So we can tune that here. Good. And similarly, for the other m estimate methods, the different choices of psi, when there's a tuning parameter, you can often use this to tune the balance of efficiency and robustness. And I write a few more in the notes, but let me just take one of these. So if rho epsilon is mod epsilon, that is the extreme case when t equals zero, then efficiency doesn't go down to zero, but what we get is no expectation. We call that the LAV estimator divided by ordinary least squares seems to be 0 0.64. And again, I have not checked the mass myself, so that is straight from the literature. Good. And in the second part, of this section, what I do there is, it is again quite informal, I show you two more estimators which solve the problem of finding estimators for a regression line with high breakdown point. So if you think back, the M estimator had breakdown point 1 over N and then asymptotically 0. And the last thing I want to do here basically is to improve on that. And there are two estimators which were proposed in the literature and there are more, but two we are going to discuss here. The first one is least median of squares, LMS, and that is defined as hark min over all parameter vectors beta, and then the median, and then we use the usual thing, our observation yi minus the predicted value, maybe I just write it xi transpose beta here, when xi is the i's row of the design matrix, and then median is over all samples, so 1 to n. Good. And you see what has happened here. I write maybe for comparison beta hat on a least squares. That's the one we discussed for so much of the module. That is again best beta. But then instead of median, we have some i from 1 to n yi minus yi hat. I just write xi transpose beta here squared. Oh, and I forgot the square here. So you see what has happened. We have replaced the sum with the median, and that is clear, it makes it more robust, namely if one of the x or the y values is an outlier, or both, then the residual will be very large, but the median does not care about extreme values, it just cares about where is the middle of the distribution, so from that we can already guess the breakdown point must be one half. And the disadvantage of this estimator is the efficiency is terrible. Namely, before we had sigma squared over n for ordinary least squares. And here it turns out, so it's still 1 over variance. And again, I want to not be too pedantic about what exactly we are looking at. But it turns out here the variance goes like 1 over n to the 2 third rather than 1 over n. And you can write sigma squared here safely. And you see that 2 third that is bad because that means the variance decays slower with the sample size than it does for ordinary least squares. So if we do efficiency of LMS divided by efficiency of ordinary least squares, that will go to zero as n goes to infinity. So in comparison to ordinary least squared, that method works not well. 
And you can see why that is, namely the median looks only at the samples in the sample in the middle, which is good for robustness, but that means it loses quite a bit of information. So most of the samples are ignored, which is good for outliers, but bad for accurately estimating the regression coefficients. So that does not help, and we pay for that here with the rate which is worse. And because people realize this, there is another method proposed, which is called least trimmed squares, and we just write that, least trimmed squares. And that is same as before, arc min beta. And now what it does is it tries to compromise between the solutions. So it has some i from one to something, but then it doesn't take all of the terms here. It takes only a certain fraction. Let's take the k. And what it does is it takes the k smallest of these. So let's give this a name. Let's do r squared i where I use these round brackets again to indicate the residuals are sorted in increasing order. So where ri is, as before, yi minus xi transpose beta. Maybe I should use a different symbol here because we sort it in increasing order of squares. So in r1 squared, that's I know equal to r2 squared, and so on up to rn squared. So that's the order statistics only. I order it in increasing order of squared values, and then I take the smallest k of them. And you can already guess, maybe, from thinking about the median, we should have at least half of the samples here, else the regression line would be fitted to a small number of outliers, where it would fit maybe better than to the large bulk of the data. So for k bigger than n over 2, and it seems also clear k controls the robustness of the method. Namely, if k equals n, then we have the same terms as here, only in a different order. The order doesn't matter for the sum. So we have ordinary least squares for k equals n. And, and the more terms we throw out, the more outliers we can ignore. And you can guess from this, it seems obvious, the breakdown point of the method, that is, how many samples do we need to change to make the estimators go to infinity? And here, if we have k terms included, to include at least one bad term, we need to have n minus k plus 1 outliers. So the breakdown point is n minus k plus 1 over n. And you see k can go down all the way nearly to n over 2. So n minus k can be close to n over 2. So that here we can get close to 1 half, which is quite good. Good. And I mentioned efficiency. So that is the last thing we should discuss here. And the efficiency of least trimmed squared compared to the efficiency of ordinary least squares. That is now better than zero, but not much better, namely that one can show is approximately equal to 0 0.08, which is a small value, but it is better than the wrong rate we had for this method. So that is an improvement, and that was the reason this method was proposed in the literature. Good. And there is one last point which I just want to mention, but not go into. It turns out this one here is a bit tricky compute, because here, if you say the k smallest residuals, that depends, of course, on beta. If you choose different betas, then you have different residuals. And that is accounted for mathematically here. We just say we take the best betas. But computationally, that is not easy. So we just do a picture. So if we have some points here and some points here, so let's say it's x and y. Then we need to, for example, try that regression line. That will hopefully be the winner if the method works. So we do the residuals. And let's say we want to do five residuals. So we would take the smallest five, maybe here and here and here and here and here. I'm not quite sure. And then we can adjust the line a bit until these five residuals are minimized. But instead, we could throw that one out and include this point here then we would need to wiggle the line a bit differently, and maybe that gives them a better fit and the smaller sum of the smallest five residuals. And in the picture, that's easy to see that that line is no good, but of course, this line you would need to also try one way or other, and there are lines here, and all of these in the picture, it seems trivial, are not as good as the one I drew first, 
but trying that out if there are more points and more inputs is really not easy. So for small n, the solution is to try all combinations of k points out of n, fit the regression line to c's, and then look how small you get the residuals for these points. But that requires n choose k different combinations and you know these combinatorical things. If n is large, that number becomes infeasible very quickly. And then that approach doesn't work anymore. And instead, one just picks small numbers of points, for example, at random, fits a regression line, and then checks whether by chance more points lie on the same regression line and repeats this often. And there are approximate algorithms like this. But we don't need to worry about that here. The method is built into R. And in the notes, you can see how to compute this estimate using R. And somebody has solved this problem already for us. Good. And that was everything I wanted to tell you here. So this is the end of this video. And you will have noticed that was less formal and we did less details than in the previous sections. And that is on purpose, just to give you a bit of an outlook of a topic which we don't have the capacity to fully cover here. But there is a bit more detail in the notes. So you should now go to the notes and read the corresponding section and make sure you get at least the detail I've written there. And that is all from me. So I have to say goodbye now. And hopefully I'll see you soon somewhere. Bye bye.